Hey, good morning guys. I'm Dana and welcome back to Inverter Always. In today's video, we're gonna be headed back down to that VRV commercial project that we started the commissioning on earlier this week. The contractor got the leak fixed, got the system pulled back down into a vacuum and added all of the refrigerant that was needed back into the system. So we're gonna go back down today. We're gonna to run the system through test operation, hook up our service checker tool, we're gonna go through and do a port check, make sure the contractor landed all of the correct wires of each indoor unit on the correct port of each branch box so that we didn't have any cross wiring. And then we're gonna do some performance checks. We'll run the system in cooling, we'll run the system in heating, and then we'll run the system in parallel or simultaneous heating and cooling operation just to make sure that everything is operating as efficiently as possible. If you guys enjoyed today's video, please make sure to click the like button below, it really helps out my channel. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. Thank you so much, guys. All right, let's jump right in. Now, in the last video, we left off needing to run the system through something called test operation. We were unable to do this because the outdoor unit had a leak, which is why we completed all of our controls work and programming in that first video. Before you start the test, make sure all the thermostats are in the off position. If any of them are turned on either accidentally or because the end users see the display and think they can operate the system now, you're going to get a U3 error code. If you see this error code, it's because the system has not been ran through the test operation. You'll know there's an error on the NAV controller because the on off button will blink the green LED. Again, make sure you turn off all the thermostats and then proceed to the outdoor unit to start the test operation. All right, so once we're ready to run the test operation from a blank screen, all we need to do is press and hold the set button, and we're gonna press and hold it until the screen says T01. It'll be a little lowercase t yep. with a zero one. And you can, again, kind of see it on camera. You can see it in person really well though. It does say T01. It's also important to note that you do not want to start the test operation until you've added all of the remaining field refrigerant charge. We did not cover this in the last video because the contractor had already added all the field charge during the vacuum process. Test operation will take up to one hour and during the test the outdoor unit screen will change from T01 through T10. Once complete the screen will go back to a blank screen automatically. Also during the test, your thermostats will all be locked out and will display test on each screen. Once test operation has completed, you may now operate the equipment normally from the thermostats and or from the ITM central controller. Before you let the end users loose though, it's important to note to connect a Daikin service checker to the equipment and monitor the operation of each unit. And since I know you are all going to want one of these tools, to purchase a Daikin service checker, the service technician must first complete the Daikin technical courses required to qualify for this tool. Techs must complete the Daikin commercial VRV installation class, VRV commissioning, as well as Daikin VRV service and troubleshooting. To sign up for a class, techs can go to their local vendor or rep, or they may also contact Daikin directly for a list of available class dates and locations. Once a technician has completed all required training, the vendor or rep can then order a service checker for the technician. I'm going to be using the technician's Daikin service checker type 4 in today's video, which at this time is the latest tool hardware version. Before we start recording any data, we need to make sure the service checker is connected properly. You want to connect the service checker to one end of the outdoor unit F1, F2 daisy chain. This ensures you will see everything installed on site. I will commonly connect to the end of the comm wire landed at the ITM central controller, and I do this for a few reasons. Reason number one is in my area of North America, it rains a lot. So connecting to the ITM means I'm connecting inside the building, staying dry and out of the elements. The other reason I like to connect here is for quick, easy access to the entire building controls via the ITM. If I need to lock something out or batch command entire systems, I have the ITM right next to me for easy access. The third reason I like to connect here is to make it easier should I need to walk around the job back and forth to check or fix something I won't have to get on and off the roof. Once you connect the service checker on the F1, F2 daisy chain, you'll want to connect your USB connector to the service checker and the other end to the PC, laptop, or tablet device that you're using to record data. Make sure that you turn on the on off switch as well. To set up a recording, we're going to open the software and go up to the settings tab. 
Here we'll find the port setting, which is the PC's USB port we've plugged the service checker into. If you do not already know your port setting, you may go to your computer's device manager to find this under COM and LPT ports. We're also going to select permission in the central operations setting, which will allow us to control the indoor units from our computer while recording. We'll talk more about this shortly. Last, make sure to select the proper unit of measure. I'm going to be using Fahrenheit MPSI in my area. Once we've set up the parameters, click on record. At the customer selection window, create a new customer or click on an existing customer from previous recordings that you want to use. You can see this tech has a few customers already populating from other jobs, so I've blurred this for privacy. Here I'm going to click on create new customer. If you are creating a new customer, you need to fill in at least the two lines at the top uh, filled with their information, but none of the rest is required. The new customer populates in the window, and once you've clicked on the customer, click on Select Customer on the right-hand side of the screen. The next window will be called Network Map. Think of this as your project file. You may go out to multiple job sites for the same customer and each time continue to click on that existing customer. Each time you connect, you're going to create a new network map for that customer, i.e. a new project file. And over time, all of your project recordings will populate in this window for this customer. It's a nice, easy way to keep things organized rather than having every single recording on the main customer screen with 14 of the same customers showing on it. Go ahead and click on new on the right hand side of the screen and a message window will display. This message basically says that when you connect the system, it will go into a brief standby period during the connection process. This is normal when connecting, so go ahead and click OK. When you click OK, you will be prompted to create the network map name. I will usually type in the job and what I'm doing. So here today, I'll type in the job name again blurred for privacy of the contractor and then i'll add either port check startup or performance test depending on which part of the data i'm monitoring and then click on ok if for any reason you miswired the f1f2 daisy chain or if you didn't select the correct com port or if you forgot to turn on the service checker you will get an error and the network map will fail to display any equipment once you've established a proper connection, you will see all the outdoor and indoor icons populate on the network map screen. It's really important at this point to be patient while the equipment populates because it can take a couple of minutes. If you see white icons, this typically means there is a comm issue and the unit cannot pull in for some reason. If you see purple, there is a communication error that's active and needs to be addressed. We didn't have any of the purple icons today, so I don't have those to show you, sorry. We did get some red icons though, which means there's an error code on the equipment. Basically what happened, the end user decided they did not want controllers on some of the indoor units, and by removing the wiring from them, the units went into alarm because then the indoor unit couldn't communicate with the nav controller. It was an easy addressing fix to make them all work in one group, but I took this screenshot before we did anything to show you what it would look like because this is a somewhat common error. You'll also get this error if you duplicate any addresses on the network. Another reason to have that as built with you that we talked about in part one of this project. You're looking for all the indoor and outdoor equipment to pull in and either turn gray, which means the unit is off or green, which means the unit is on. If you have more than one system, you can click the up and down buttons in the lower left corner of the screen to switch between different systems. We only had one system on this project, but this is a really good reason to airnet address the outdoor equipment, which we did in the first video of this project. You can see here the outdoor icons are addressed as one. Should we have had more systems on this project, I would have then airnet addressed each system accordingly, two, three, four, etc. I'm not going to go into every detail in this video because it's not really a training for you all. I'm really just talking you through the process that I take to get started for reference. There are definitely tons of things that we're skipping throughout all of this, small details, bullet points that you will certainly want to learn from a technical class, but this will at least get you started and help you follow along. You can see there are two icons for the outdoor equipment, and that's because we have two outdoor units installed. And then you can see 29 indoor icons, and that's because we have 29 indoor units installed. 
take a moment and look at all the numbers underneath each icon. Notice there is what we call a group address indicated on the lower left of each icon, followed by what we call an AirNet address on the lower right of each icon. We programmed all of these in the video, which was part of the last video we did last week. And this is part one of the startup. I always recommend programming both of these items. For starters, you're already in the settings of the thermostat programming field settings. And this takes literally a couple of extra seconds to program if you have your as built with you. Programming the group address allows you to control the indoor units from the ITM and or from the service checker tool. And since we have an ITM central controller on this project, the group addresses were going to be required to be controlled from the ITM anyways. Many times techs will ask, do I need to program this if I don't have an ITM? And I always say yes, because at some point you'll want this control available from a service checker when taking runtime, especially in some cases where you don't have access to all the spaces and there's no ITM on site. When it comes to AirNet addresses, these are used for several different things. The first is a monitoring program that Daikin uses called DNet, which allows Daikin to monitor the equipment 24-7, 365. It has predictive air monitoring as well and notifications should it see anything going wrong. It's a very cool program I always recommend on commercial projects. There is one other very important reason for these AirNet addresses to be set as well. Take a look at the icons once more you'll see that not all indoor icons display a group address. This happens when two or more indoor units are part of the same group. Only one indoor unit within the group will display the group address. The others will not. By programming AirNet addresses into each unit, we can see very specifically which unit is which. This is going to be very important shortly when we're looking at raw data points to check the branch box ports for cross wiring. I'll explain this more in detail shortly. I strongly encourage you to familiarize yourselves with the lower toolbar as well. There are three main tabs that when clicked will generate different sub tabs directly below them. Map mode is what we'll use to generate the central control window, which looks like this. And I'll talk about this in just a moment. The display mode tab is what we'll use to generate the raw data display windows, which looks like this. And again, I'll talk more about this shortly. The last main tab is called the record tab. This is what we'll use to set up the recording parameters and start or stop our recordings. Unfortunately, I was unable to capture a screenshot of the recording setup window itself. It is very straightforward though. Select 60 second screenshot intervals and then click on OK. You don't need to change anything else in that window. Once you've set up the recording interval, simply click on PC record start. You will know you are recording because that tab will change to PC record end. And up at the top left of the screen in red, you will see text which says PC record. Now go back to the map mode tab. We're going to open up the central control window and talk about that. From here, we can click on each group address, turn on or off the unit, change mode of operation and adjust the set point. It's important to note that regardless if you selected Fahrenheit in the settings at the beginning of this video, this particular window will always display the set point in Celsius. There is still, after I don't know how many years, no fix for this, so we're stuck using Celsius. I guess it's just a hint we should probably just get with the times and convert to what the rest of the world uses. We're going to use this window throughout our data monitoring process as we go through our port check and check one unit at a time from cooling to heating. Speaking of port check, there is a very unique process that I personally use for port checking which saves a ton of time on each project. To give you the brief version, I will put the entire building into cooling and let it operate for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then I will put the first port of every branch box into the heat mode. Because we are checking for cross wiring within a particular branch box, we can check for cross wiring on every single box simultaneously because we are telling each unit wired to each box's port A, for example, to switch to heat. As long as you only change one unit on each box at a time, you're going to be fine following this process. The other thing to keep in mind is that an as-built is an absolute must for this part of the operation. You need to know which units are wired to which boxes and ports. It's very, very rare that an indoor unit gets wired to a completely different box compared to what the as-built would say. It happens, but it's rare. 
Most of the time, the issues that arise are there are two or more indoor units on a single branch box that get wired to the incorrect ports, and we'll find out what this looks like shortly. By doing a port check in this manner, we can reduce the time that it takes to complete this process. The maximum number of ports on the largest box is 12. And that means we can change over only 12 times and have the entire job site completed. Each port takes approximately five minutes to change over, plus we'll save five more minutes to analyze the data on some of the larger projects when there are lots of systems and lots of boxes. That means we can nearly port check any project within a two hour time frame. Of course, there are extremely large projects with multiple communication networks, plus distractions and phone calls, lunch, you name it. So it's not always going to be quite this smooth, but it goes way faster than one indoor unit at a time. Just saying. Now that we're comfortable with the central control window and how it works, the last tab to click on is the display tab and then click on display op data, which means display the operational data. A new window will populate for the system currently shown on the network map display above. And you can populate multiple display windows. So what I'll typically do is display my AirNet one system data, then click the up down buttons at the bottom left of the network map, and then I'll display data for AirNet two, and then so on and so forth. And this allows me to organize my data display windows and snap from system to system as I'm changing one unit on every box of every system all at the same time. So let's take a look at some operational data now and see what happens during the port check. Here you can see the entire system is in the cool mode. I'm going to switch over the first port of each of our three branch boxes now to the heat mode. That's port A for all three boxes. The system will take about five minutes to change over and a few extra minutes since this is the first set of ports going to heat mode before the indoor units actually start heating. You'll notice that each indoor unit has data shown in segments, first I1, then I2, then I3, all the way down to I29. These I numbers are the icon numbers shown back on the network map. And you may have noticed that each unit was pulled into the network in what seems like a totally random order. So let's look at one of the indoor units in heat mode. How about we take a look at I-28? It's all the way near the bottom of our list. You can see that this unit was switched to the heat mode based on the set point and the mode that it's displaying heat. You can also see that it's receiving the proper hot gas here as well by looking at the indoor unit gas pipe thermistor. This indicates that when this unit calls for heat, the port at the box opens and sends hot gas to this unit. We can check this unit off our list as a correctly wired indoor unit. But let's say hypothetically that we did not see hot gas going to this indoor unit, or let's say there was something else wrong with this unit. Maybe the EEV was malfunctioning or the fan wasn't operating, whatever the scenario, you name it. If we go back to the network map display and count to I-28, the only way we know which unit this particular I-28 is, is because of the AirNet address. Take I-16, for example. You can see there are just dashes for the group address, and this is because it's part of another indoor icons group. So if I-16 was the unit having issues instead of I-28, and we didn't AirNet address this unit earlier on in the startup process, it would just say zero. If all the indoor units just say zero because we didn't address any of them, how are we ever going to know which unit is having the issues? It quickly becomes a huge guessing game, an absolute nightmare, and to me, time is money. I want to know immediately exactly which unit I'm having issues with so I can find the unit on the job and fix the problem without having to guess and power cycle the equipment 30 times. The good news is that our first set of ports were all wired correctly, and you can see here that we have hot gas going to all three of the indoor units that are in heat. So now it's time to switch over the second set of ports of each box over to heat. So this time it'll be port B of each of our boxes. Again, a five minute wait period for the indoor units to equalize, receive hot gas, and open the EEV at the indoor unit to heat the space. You can see though, we have a small problem. Group address 1-02, which is I-27, is calling for heat but not receiving any hot gas to the indoor coil. We can see this by looking at the indoor unit gas pipe thermistor data value. 
This means that 1-02 actually got wired to a different port. We don't know which port though. So we need to look at all the other indoor units and see which indoor unit is calling for cooling, but is actually receiving that hot gas. And you don't have to look far in this particular case because I-29 is getting hot gas right now and it's in the cool mode. Here is where a lot of folks make the big mistake though. The first instinct is to think, oh, these two units must be crisscrossed. But if you were to assume this, you would very possibly be wrong. All we know with certainty at this point is that port B, which is group address 1-02, actually got landed on what we think is port C, uh, I-29, group address 1-03. We know this because from our as-built sheets, it says 1-02 was originally installed and wired to port B, while group address 1-03 was landed on port C. There is of course a possibility that our as built are wrong, so we want to assume nothing yet. What we'll want to do next is switch over port C to heat and see if I-27 now gets the hot gas. The idea here is I-29 got I-27's hot gas, and so now we want to follow the heat, follow the hot gas, turn I-29 to heat and see where the hot gas goes because it's either going to go to I-27 or I-29 is also crosswired to a different port. I've seen many times where text will assume it's crossed with one other unit, flip them, and then find out they only made the problem worse and now they have even more crossed units. Never make a change until you can 100% confirm which unit is crossed with which unit. Simply follow the trail of hot gas. We changed port B to heat, the hot gas went to the next group address in line, so we're going to switch that one over to heat now and see what happens. You can see switching the next set of ports over confirmed what we thought, and the hot gas went to I-27, which is group address 102 on our as builts, which is port B of the branch box that this unit got wired to. It's also important to note here that along the way, the other two boxes have been checking out just fine so far. Don't want you to think that I was just skipping those. I am looking at those as well. We're going to go ahead and we're gonna work through the rest of the ports before we make any changes to the box wiring, just in case there are any other problems that we find. Again, I don't want to constantly recycle power to the equipment. It takes extra time which there is no need to waste if there are still other problems on the equipment. So to summarize, we had port B and port C crossed on one of the boxes. As we continue to work through each port of each box, everything looks good and we complete all the port checks smoothly and quickly. When we finished our port check, all the equipment was in the heat mode. So I saved my recording and now I'm gonna go ahead and start a new file to begin my performance testing, and we're gonna start in the heat mode since the system is already in the heat mode. You certainly don't have to start a new file. I just like to keep my port checks and my performance tests separate. In case I need to go back later to review something, I have less data overall to review because I've separated it all into different batches based on what I've been doing. In the heat mode, I'm going to be looking at a lot of stuff here, about two days worth of training type stuff actually. So again, I remind you, this is not a technical training, more just a narrative to bring you all along for the ride. I check the discharge superheat. It's a little low, but within normal range. I then quickly check my outdoor heat exchanger temperature to make sure my four-way valves aren't sticking at all and letting hot gas into the outdoor coil. This would be bad for heat mode. Next, I'll scroll down and check subcooling at each indoor unit. Nine or 10 degrees would be optimal, but I'll accept seven to 16 without really blinking much. I found a few indoor units flirting with low subcool values, but it's important to note that we're looking at screenshots and not live data. So if anything arises that you think is bad, sit on it for a few minutes to make sure it corrects or investigate what could be causing the problem. Coil temps all looked good though and we had about 100 degree Fahrenheit gas coming back to the condenser outside. So I'll check EEV positions at the outdoor unit and make sure the outdoor is maintaining proper superheat. Everything looks good here as well. I'll typically make this loop several times during the course of an hour or more depending on how good the data looks. It's also important to note that I'm looking at way more stuff than what we just breezed through. 
There's compressor RPS, indoor EEV positions, subcooling heat exchanger data points at the outdoor unit, suction temperature at the outdoor unit as well, amp draw, fan speed, safeties. Like I said before, about two days worth of training to get through all of these points. But at the end of the day, things are looking okay. After running heat mode for a little while, I set everything back to the cooling mode so I could take some performance checks in cooling. Again, I'm going to make a similar loop as before, but in the opposite direction. I always start with the compressor. Discharge superheat looks okay here. It's not optimal, but it's within normal range. The ultra coil temps look good. You can see hot gas condensing to liquid properly here, which indicates correct flow direction through the four-way valves. The refrigerant will go through the subcooler here to ensure we have proper liquid distribution to the indoor equipment. So far, so good. Indoor units EEV will all modulate to control superheat at each indoor unit respectively. So again, I'm going to look at op an optimal target of 9 or 10 degrees. Some units running a little low, but nothing too dangerous. Several units just slightly above the 10 degree mark. Uh, I'm okay with 15 degrees in most cases and have heard that Daikin is okay with anything up to 27 or 30 degrees. At the end of the day, I think their engineers are more concerned with not enough rather than too much. Too much isn't necessarily the end of the world, but not enough means flooding and flooding kills compressors. So yeah, I'm fine with 15. I'm sure you're also wondering what this big graph is for. By default, every time you display a new data window, the program will populate certain data points. I like to personally select my own during the startups based on what I'm checking for. For example, I always like to graph the thermo on status of the system so I know when the outdoor has a demand or call to operate. It makes it very easy to see because the blue bar will populate near the bottom, which is easy to see while I'm scrolling around looking at other stuff. I also like to plot the target condensing and evaporating temperatures and the actual condensing and evaporating temperatures of each outdoor module as well so I can see how close to targets the system is maintaining. This also helps a ton while scrolling through all the data points because if the system shuts off or changes modes suddenly or goes into oil return or defrost, I can immediately see the change on the graph which flags my attention. That way, I'm not misanalyzing the data points that I'm scrolling around looking at. And speaking of oil return and defrost, I will graph both of those modes. So if either turns on, it will notify me at the bottom with a blue bar, similar to how the thermo on status bar will display during demand. I will typically graph the suction temperature of the outdoor unit. This allows me to easily check for cross piping between the dual pressure pipe and the suction pipe. Should you have two one and one eighth inch pipes, for example, and not label them, there is a very likely chance that you cross them and when the outdoor operates in heat, it will basically bypass that hot gas directly back to the outdoor unit and then either blow out one of the fused plugs or damage the compressor directly. Graphing the suction temperature allows me to keep a close eye on this without scrolling up and down a bunch. For the most part, this is all that I'll graph I will often add a few other safeties like discharge temperature or amp draw, and that way I can see if one of them turns on. They are some of the more common safeties that would turn on uh, compared to the others, at least in my experience and in my area. And then depending on the situation or what I'm monitoring, sometimes I'll graph other stuff like four-way valve positions, compressor RPSs, whatever I need to keep a close eye on without wanting to scroll up and down a lot. So at the end of the day, you can use this however you want. All of the data will record, so it's good to know you can graph whatever you want simply for a reference during the recording without affecting the actual recording. Once we've completed the performance tests, we're going to close out of the display window, close out of the central control window too, and then go back to the network map window. Click on record mode and then click on PC record end. Then from here, just cancel your way back out to the main screen, at which time you may exit the program. All of your recordings are saved locally on your computer, laptop, or tablet device that you used, and you can access the recordings via the Play tab from the main screen of the Service Checker software. You can also transfer the data to other people by using the Data Transfer option, but we aren't going to go into any of that in today's video. At the end of the day, you guys, I would say this was a pretty smooth startup. I really enjoyed it, and thank you to the contractor for inviting me out to help. 
Uh, of course, there was a few hiccups along the way, but I would probably rate this an 8.5 out of 10 as far as startups are concerned. The issues that we had were minor issues, nothing too major, and it would get higher scores if the outdoor unit didn't have a leak. I realized this is not the fault of the contractor. Sometimes this happens. The two pipes rub together during transportation from the factory to the job site. The contractor was awesome. They stepped in, they got the leak repaired in a timely manner so that we could come back out within the same week and knock out this startup. So thank you very much to the contractor for knocking that out, I appreciate it. We had a couple hiccups with wiring earlier in the week as well. And then today we had a small addressing issue because of some thermostats that were gonna be removed after the startup. So we had to fix that again. Minor issues, not a big deal. The system performed well today. Wasn't 100%, but it was pretty good. We had two wires that were crisscrossed on ports B and C of one of the branch boxes. And so that also is taken into consideration with my score of an 8.5. But all in all, it was a pretty good day. I enjoyed the startup. And again, thank you to the contractor for having me out. I appreciate it. I hope this information has been helpful for you guys. If you guys enjoyed today's video, please make sure to click the like button below. It really helps out my channel. And if you guys haven't already, please consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching Inverter Always. I hope you guys have an awesome day.